with that out of the way, I'm going to uh, start my actual presentation, which is going to talk about the mobile platform world. I'm going to talk a little bit about browsers later on, but what I've noticed is that uh, basically web developers should have a general idea of where the mobile platforms like iOS, Android, Windows Phone, etc., are going. Because uh, that, uh, that knowledge is sometimes lacking, and I uh, must admit that the mobile platform market is quite confusing. I mean, uh, before the break, Horace talked a bit about the more like the financial and disruptive side uh, of the story. What I'm going to do now is give more of a kind of an introduction to what is actually going on right now. Because when the uh, iPhone disruption happened, most companies didn't quite know what to do. Meanwhile, they've grown at least accustomed to the new way of uh, doing business in the mobile space, and they've also grown accustomed to the fact that you have to run uh, apps and websites on your phone. So the concept I'd like to talk about first is the stack. We are web developers, right? So to us, the most important question is, which browser is my user running? And we can see all kinds of statistics uh, there. Um, uh, usually you have a pretty decent idea of uh, what you want your website to work on. Um, but just looking at the browser is not quite enough, uh, especially not for the players in the mobile market, because to them the browser is an app, a very important app, but still an app. The browser runs on top of an operating system. Um, basically, the operating system determines which kind of browsers can run in it, right? On Windows Phone, you have only IE. Uh, on iOS, you have uh, only Safari and some proxy browsers. On Android, you've got a lot of browsers. Basically, the operating system is uh, very important to us web developers, too. And actually, uh, I'm mostly going to talk about these operating systems. Below the operating system, though, is the device, the pure hardware. <coughs> And this is basically the stack we are having. Um, because Apple basically owns the entire stack, Apple creates its own hardware, its own software, and its own browser. Because that is the case, it's commonly assumed uh, that most, if not all, players should do this. Um, what, uh, what we are seeing is basically uh, a movement converging on, OK, I want to own the entire stack, too, from all the other players in the mobile market with various uh, success. What people generally don't realize is that apart from Apple, there's a second player that owns the entire stack, device, operating system, and browser, and that's BlackBerry. BlackBerry, too, creates its own devices, its own operating system, and its own browser. So this is one business model, right? This is the business model of doing everything for yourself. And the big advantage here, of course, is uh, that you can tightly integrate uh, the hardware and the software. And uh, that was especially Apple's uh, big idea back when they started on the iPhone. They wanted to make sure that that integration was really, really tight, and that worked. Meanwhile, BlackBerry has uh, gone that way, too. But it's not really the dominant uh, business model out there. Because the other uh, business model is basically shown by Android. What Google does is it doesn't create devices, it creates an operating system, including a browser, right? And um, uh, that is basically uh, what Android is, and they basically give it away to whoever uh, wants it. The other player that does that, of course, is Microsoft with Windows Phone. It's exactly the same business model. Hey, we've got an operating system for you in case you need it for your devices. And um, basically, that's why you see a lot of device vendors using both Android and Windows Phone. I mean, Android is uh, sold far better, for reasons we'll go into in a moment. But uh, you have to realize that this is the same business model. What you also have to realize is that there's an inherent tension between the operating system vendor on the one hand and the device vendor on the other hand. What a device vendor wants most of all, especially if he basically has to buy an operating system for somebody else, what a device vendor wants in that case is to be able to distinguish himself from his competitors, right? So basically, uh, both Samsung and HTC create Android phones, but they don't want that Android phones to be exactly the same. Because if they were, the consumer wouldn't care whether he bought a Samsung or an HTC. And both Samsung and HTC want to keep their brand in the, in the minds of the consumers, right? So they want to be different from each other. And that goes for all Android and Windows Phone uh, vendors, basically. 
However, on the other hand, both Google and Microsoft have a vested interest in keeping um, that whole fragmentation low because it's uh, difficult for developers, it's difficult for Google itself and for Microsoft itself. And um, basically, it also allows their brand, Google, Microsoft, or Windows, Android, whatever, to take over in the mind of the consumer. What Google and Microsoft would ideally want to see is a user, a consumer that buys an Android phone and not a Samsung phone, right? And Samsung, of course, wants exactly the opposite. Samsung wants uh, consumers to come into the store and say, oh, give me the latest Samsung phone. So we're seeing an inherent tension here um, between basically uh, differentiation, which is what device vendors want, and unification, which is what the operating system vendors want. And this has played out uh, several times already in the mobile market. Uh, specifically, when Android started back in, what was it, 2009 or something, um, they basically said, OK, you want our operating system, here you go, do whatever you like. And that was one of the reasons that initially Android became so very successful, because the device vendors could actually build their own UI on top of Android and change little bits in the browser and add apps and so on. I mean, basically, the only thing that Google really wanted is to have their own suite of apps installed on the Android device, right? The Android market, uh, the Google Maps, and several other apps. That is what Google said, OK, you have to install these, but whatever else you do is your uh, problem and your business. So that's why Android initially was very successful in the market. However, around Android 3, uh, which was the tablet uh, Android, um, Google kind of started changing its mind and tried to get uh, people more towards the same user experience and the same technical infrastructure. Because they were seeing that was with this whole pr proliferation of Android devices, it became more and more difficult to write native Android apps and web apps that were suited to, to Android, because there was just too much difference between the various devices. Uh, I vividly remember it was about a year ago or something. I came to uh, Mirabeau here in uh, Amsterdam, and they said, hey, yeah, yeah, we've got uh, Android 3 tablets. Do you want to see them? I said, sure. And I think it was a Samsung and a Motorola tablet. And the first uh, thing that really sprung out to me was these tablets are exactly the same. They have the same user interface. Uh, I tested the browsers, of course, but because uh, that's what I do, and I found no difference between the browsers. <laughs> Uh, basically, the only difference was the home screen. There were some slightly different apps on the Motorola and on the Samsung tablet. Now, this is great for Google, right? This is great for developers. This could potentially be good for consumers too, although I'm not totally sure what consumers uh, think of this issue. It's horrible, however, for Samsung and Motorola, because a consumer doesn't care anymore whether he buys a Samsung or a Motorola tablet. It's just an Android tablet. Give me an Android tablet. So this is um, an issue that Android has run into. It's also part of the reason why uh, Android upgrades uh, are, so f are so very slow on the phones out there. I, most of the actual phones out there still run a certain ver version of Android 2. And there are, of course, technical uh, issues with updating uh, that Android version. But there's also the idea, OK, if I upgrade it, then it will be exactly the same as every other phone. And the, and the device vendors don't like that. Microsoft was much clearer in that regard from the very start. They said, OK, if you want Windows Phone, that's fine. But we tell you exactly which hardware to use and how the UI should uh, look like. And you may not make ch any changes in that. And basically, the device vendors didn't really like that. Most of them said, OK, we're going to create a few Windows phone phones. But they didn't put a heart in it, right? They said, OK, this Windows Phone is going to be the same as the next Windows Phone anyway, so why bother? So that's the inherent tension in the whole idea of device vendors buying or getting an operating system elsewhere. And we haven't talked about one uh, major mobile player yet, which is Nokia. Nokia, uh, the old strategy of Nokia used to look like this. Basically, they had uh, two platforms, S40 and uh, Symbian. S40 was the feature phone platform. It's the Nokia Asha I showed you just now. And Symbian was the high-end, the smartphone platform. And browser-wise, they kind of tried to uh, uh, keep things together. Um, because basically, when I tested my first S40 phones, which was a modern S40 phone, I thought, hey, this browser is pretty similar to the old Symbian browser. 
I mean, S40 phones are cheaper, which means they use, uh, use less powerful hardware, which means that they can't run the most modern version of any browser. But an older version can run fine on an S40 phone. So that was uh, what, uh, was what Nokia was doing. They were uh, kind of trying to keep it together. And they succeeded quite decently. I mean, the S40 browser is not the same as the Symbian browser, but at least it's similar. Um, however, Nokia understood uh, that in the end they would need a replacement for Symbian because Symbian was getting old, it was uh, not quite optimal anymore for development, especially when compared to iOS and Android, which are much easier to develop for. So they decided that in the end they would go to uh, this sort of situation where Migo, the new Migo operating system, which runs on the Nokia N9 as, uh, I showed you, uh, where the Migo operating system uh, will kind of silently replace Symbian. And everybody thought, okay, yeah, that's a pretty decent strategy. Symbian's getting old, but Nokia is working on a new operating system. And everybody said, yeah, this is going to work. That was the situation at the end of two, uh, 2010. In 2011, last year, we ha had two major changes in the market, and actually the larger part of my presentation is talking about those two changes. The first one was announced back in uh, February 2011, when all of a sudden Nokia uh, announced that they were going to use Windows Phone instead of Migo. Um, this led to a very different reaction. Some said, yeah, this is an excellent idea. Uh, Nokia needs a new operating system. Um, uh, Migo can't quite cut it, uh, which, is uh, which is basically uh, because Migo uh, was fairly slow to actually emerge onto the market, and people didn't quite trust the operating system without ha uh, ever having seen it. I've seen it, and it's absolutely fine. It could have survived in the market on its own. But anyway, um, they decided, okay, we're going to go for Windows Phone. Some uh, people say, yeah, that's a great idea, and others said, oh no, this is a completely lousy idea. So far, it seems like the people who said it was a lousy idea have got it right. I will uh, get back to Windows Phone uh, in a bit. Uh, what Nokia hoped, obviously, was that a Nokia and happy Nokia consumer would go into a store, say, hey, my old Nokia uh, needs a replacement, and the store clerk would say, oh, yeah, we've got this new Nokia here. It's a Windows Phone instead of Symbian. And that's blah, blah, blah for the average consumer, right? He doesn't know what Symbian is. He doesn't know what Windows Phone is. But he says, it's a Nokia. Yeah, fine. That did not quite happen for reasons I'll get into later. Um, on the other hand, uh, side of the market, all the other uh, phone vendors thought, OK, so Windows Phone is basically uh, the operating system where all the devices look alike. And in addition, now we have to compete with Nokia, which was back then still the largest uh, phone vendor in the world. So they kind of lost their interest in Windows Phone even more, which was a problem for Microsoft. So that was the first big change in the market. Um, the second big change happened in August 2011, when all of a sudden Google announced it was going to buy Motorola. Motorola, an Android vendor. And um, basically, what I expected to happen then was that the other Android vendors uh, would say, uh, OK, we don't want Android anymore. Why did I think so? I thought so because, first of all, we already had the inherent tension between the device vendors on the one hand and Google as an OS vendor on the other hand, right? So there was already a feeling of, okay, is Android really the way forward for us device vendors who want to differentiate uh, ourselves from the other device vendors? And now there came uh, a fear that Google would uh, give Motorola unfair advantages, such as early access to new operating systems. Google repeated again and again and again that they would not do this, but apparently they weren't quite believed by the device vendors. So this put uh, Samsung and HTC and Sony Ericsson and LG and all the other Android vendors into a tricky position. Basically, what they needed was a replacement for Android. Um, back in August uh, 2011, I thought, OK, this is it. Uh, Android is going to go down now. Uh, Motorola will, of course, uh, continue to create Android phones, but the rest will, in the course of the next year, switch over to another operating system. 
Unfortunately, that did not happen. I was completely wrong. But it's interesting uh, to figure out why I was wrong. And for that reason, I'm going to take a look at the alternatives that people had for Android, right? Because uh, basically the question was now, I'm now using Android, I need a new operating system, but with the exception of Samsung, no, none of the Android vendors is actually a, a creator of operating systems. So they ha had to get it somewhere else. The first option was WebOS. Oh, and you see that I'm starting to use uh, rather cheesy animations. Usually I don't do that, but I do it here because I'm really, really confused by this whole situation and it will become worse, trust me. WebOS, originally created by Palm, uh, the Palm Pre. Uh, WebOS was the first operating system that said, OK, we are, if you want to create native apps, use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that made me sit up and uh, take notice, right back in January 2009 or something. So that was uh, WebOS. Um, it was really days after uh, the Motorola acquisition that HP uh, all of a sudden said, OK, we are going to discontinue our hardware. We're not going to create hardware for uh, WebOS anymore. But we're going to see if we can do something with uh, the software, with WebOS itself, by other means, which basically meant uh, they tried to license or sell it. Um, back in August, September 2011, I um, fully expected to hear within the month, okay, uh, Company X has acquired or has licensed WebOS. Privately, I bet on HEC. That didn't happen. Nothing happened. You heard, oh, Samsung may be interested in WebOS. Oh, HEC may be interested in WebOS. Oh, this and that and that may be interested in WebOS. But nothing actually happened. October, November, December, nothing happened. And then in the end, HP decided to open source WebOS instead. Um, personally, I do not think that is a good move because I see it as a move of desperation. I see it as a move of a company who does not know what to do with their operating system anymore. And said, you know, we're going to throw it out into the open source community. Maybe somebody will pick it up and do something useful with it. Now, that could happen, of course. I'm not saying that that won't happen. I'm just saying I'm skeptical about it. Um, but still, that doesn't explain what actually went on behind the scenes. And as far as I can determine now, the problem with WebOS was, first of all, that HP asked too much money for it. Uh, basically, HP had paid $1.2 billion for Palm, and they wanted to recoup that entire investment. So they asked uh, their clients, OK, give us $1.2 billion for WebOS. The problem there was that I've heard several reports that the internals of WebOS was not quite good enough. Uh, the UI is fantastic. I don't know if you uh, know uh, the WebOS UI, but it's uh, really outstanding and it can easily uh, compare to iOS. However, it turned out that the internals, the actual technology stack inside WebOS wasn't quite good enough. I don't know about that. The only uh, part of the technology stack I can uh, I can say something about is the browser, and I do know that I'm not completely happy with the WebOS browser because it was basically not good enough and it uh, didn't, uh, didn't become better fast enough. So what we're seeing here is basically that WebOS apparently was not thought good enough by the market players, by Samsung, HTC, etc. probably in combination with the large amount of money that HP asked. So WebOS is not going to be uh, any replacement for Android. Migo, right, the Nokia high-end operating system. Migo was open source, more or less, and uh, Nokia, in fact, was hoping that other device vendors would also pick up on Migo, as they had done previously on Symbian. So uh, everybody was ready and everybody, uh, I kind of assumed that somebody would say, okay, we're going the Migo way. That too turned out not to be the case. Because it was end of September uh, 2011, that it was suddenly announced that Migo would be scrapped and instead uh, Migo would be uh, 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 added to a new operating system called Tizen or Tizen. Uh, nobody knows how you pronounce this because it's not actually a word. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, they chose this name for their operating system because it doesn't actually mean anything anywhere. 
which is becoming a fashion in uh, the mobile world right now. If you hear new names of new operating systems, sometimes they mean something, but sometimes they just don't. And you ask, okay, is this a Finnish word or a Swahili word for something? And the answer turns out to be no, it doesn't actually mean anything. Now, the good part of Tizen for us web developers is that it's going to be HTML5 based. I'm not totally sure what that means yet, um, although they have released the very first uh, test devices for Tizen, I think only yesterday in San Francisco, there was a Tizen conference there. So we will eventually see what's going to happen there. And the important fact for Tizen is that uh, the co-chair of the Tizen project is Samsung. And Samsung created those devices that were given out in San Francisco yesterday or the day before. So basically what I'm saying right now is that Tizen may be a replacement for Android. And if it is, it's Samsung uh, first and foremost that will do it. The question, of course, is will they release one or two Tizen phones in addition to Android, or will they eventually say, uh, okay, we're going to replace Android entirely by Tizen? I don't know. Nobody knows. I told you, this is complicated. The next option was Samsung Bada. Uh, Samsung Bada was uh, Samsung's next operating system, in addition to Android, right? And um, actually, everybody thought that Samsung was being pretty clever here. Uh, back in 2008, Samsung badly, badly, badly needed uh, an operating system for their smartphones, because initially they missed the smartphones completely, uh, and they uh, settled on Android because it was an excellent choice uh, back in those days. And as you all know, they are totally successful with their Samsung Galaxy range uh, on Android. However, uh, what not many people realize is that they had a second smartphone operating system, Bada. And as far as we could determine, uh, the whole idea was that eventually Bada would kind of quietly take over from Android. Until that time, it was uh, allowed to grow in the shadows, right? Because uh, an operating system needs iterations and iterations. The first version uh, of an operating system usually isn't very good, has lots of bugs, lots of stuff that doesn't work. So you iterate over it, create a second version, etc., etc. And everybody assumed, okay, Samsung is going to do that with Bada in the shadow of Android. While Android will be its main smartphone operating system that will sell in boatloads throughout the world. And, but one day, a day will come that Samsung says, OK, we're going to stop creating Android phones now, and instead we switch over to Bada. So when the Motorola news broke, I thought, OK, that's it. Samsung is going to announce that it's going to switch to Bada in the next, I don't know, two or three months or so. That did not happen. I was wrong once again. Um, nothing happened with Bada, basically, until, I think it was in January of this year, they suddenly announced, okay, we're going to make Bada open source. And by now you should know what making something open source means in the mobile world. It means we don't know what to do with it anymore. Which was kind of confusing to me. Later on I heard, uh, as a rumor mostly, that Bada was going to be integrated into Tizen. Because uh, from a technical perspective, these two operating systems are pretty much alike. And basically, Tizen is apparently going to take the place that Bada used to take in Samsung's portfolio. Again, this is complicated. I am not sure what's going on either. I just know that Bada is out uh, when it comes to uh, replacement for Android. Next option for replacement, Butu Gecko. Again, it was scant weeks after the Mo Motorola acquisition became known that Mozilla said, OK, we're going to create our own operating system, uh, which is going to be browser-based. Which browser? Firefox, obviously. Um, initially, I was a bit skeptical, but they made a few good decisions, but also, unfortunately, a few bad decisions. The good decision was to make it run on top of Android. Basically, as far as I understand, they take a slightly stripped down Android 2.x, they uh, put Butu Gecko on top of it, and that is basically the new operating system. And of course, the OS allows you to write applications, native applications in HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Right. Now, making it run on top of Android was actually a pretty clever move by Mozilla. 
because it told the Android vendors, who had already uh, entire factories churning out Android phones, OK, you don't actually have to change your phones all that much. Just take an Android phone that you're producing anyway and flash it with uh, the new operating system we're going to give, uh, give to you, and you can basically sell it out into, into the market. It's going to be much more complicated than that, of course, but not that much more complicated. So that, I think, was a pretty neat decision by Mozilla. However, what I was looking for in Mozilla was to in, announce a partnership with a device vendor, right? I expected, I don't know, Sony or LG or whoever who was still looking for a new operating system to uh, replace Android, to say, OK, we're going to partner with Mozilla and we're going to create Bluetooth Gecko devices. That did not quite happen. Instead, they partnered with an operator, Telefonica which is a good idea in a way and a bad idea in other ways, and I, come, I will come back to that later. In any case, boot to gecko could become uh, a replacement for Android, and basically I think that the metric to watch here is whether Mozilla will still partner with a hardware vendor. The first boot to gecko devices are going to be out in Brazil, I think in a few months or so, and it will be fairly low-end phones, not high-end phones. And they want to target, target the former feature phone market first. So churn out fairly uh, cheap devices for people who just don't have that much money. As a strategy, that's pretty interesting. I'm just wondering uh, whether the whole Firefox and Bluetooth Gecko can actually run on a low-end device, run satisfactorily on a low-end device. I don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. We'll uh, see later. But keep an eye on whether Mozilla partners with an actual device vendor, and keep an eye on how fast they will release uh, new feature phones or smartphones. And the choice of whether it's going to become a feature phone or a smartphone means a lot. Because if it's a feature phone, they say, OK, we have successfully ported Firefox to fairly low-end devices. And if they go the smartphone way, it probably says something like, OK, that feature phone thing didn't quite work. In any case, lots of questions here, too. I'm giving you more questions than answers right now. You realize that, but that's how the mobile market is. Boot to Gecko may become a replacement for Android, but I'm not sure yet. Finally, the last option is sticking with Android, pure and simple. Back in August 2011, I did not believe that for a moment, but now I'm forced to conclude that the former Android vendors have too few alternatives to the actual Android operating system. So they may stick with Android after all. I cannot answer uh, the question what's going to happen next in this post-Android market. It could very well be that Android will survive Google's acquisition of Motorola. I can't say right now. Um, but I hope I've given you enough clues so that you can kind of follow the mobile market for yourself a bit and know, uh, and know which players are important and which ones aren't. Again, Tizen, uh, keep, uh, keep a close eye on Samsung. If Samsung starts to announce Tizen phones, you know Tizen is going to amount to something. Uh, Boot to Gecko, take a look at uh, whether they partner with a device vendor or not. So this is the, my current overview of the mobile platform market. And no, it doesn't look nice, but that's because the situation is so very confusing. Unfortunately, we haven't discussed the entire mobile market yet. Because be below the stack we've seen so far, the browser, the operating system, and the device, there's a connection layer. I mean, you can have an absolutely brilliant device in your pocket with a wonderful operating system and a truly stellar browser, but if you don't have a connection, it's just a brick, right? And the connection layer is, of course, where the operators rule. And the story of the mobile market is not complete without the operators. So let's take a look at the mobile market from the op operator's point of view. Basically, for them, the connection layer is their income. Because every time you place a call, every time you send a text message, every time you use some uh, mobile data, you are giving the operator a few cents, or more than a few cents if you're roaming. And they make a lot of money with that. Part of that money they use to reinforce their own position in the market. Because what they're basically doing is saying, OK, we subsidize devices. Um, this is actually not true in all countries. I am certain that in Belgium and Italy, subsidizing devices is illegal. Operators may not do that. But in many of the biggest markets, they do. And that has a profound impact on the market. 
because basically what they are doing here is they go to the top of the stack, the sales. Because again, you can have a beautiful device with beautiful hardware and software and a wonderful browser and an excellent connection, but you still have to get it into the pocket of the consumer, right? Without that last step, your device is completely worthless. And basically what the operators have done is through their money, they now rule the sales channels. Because consider, what do you do as an average consumer when you want a new phone? You go to the operator store. Because phones are cheaper there, right? If you don't really pay attention to the mobile market, you think, okay, I can go to the Apple store and buy an iPhone for, what is it, six, seven hundred euros? Or I can go to the operator store where I get it for only 50 to 100 euros. Of course, you don't get it for only 50 to 100 euros because you have to sign a contract, right? And that con uh, you, you can be sure that the price of that contract will uh, bring uh, back much more than the, what is it, uh, five to six hundred euros that the operator borrowed you to buy your phone, right? So the operators have been very clever here, and basically what they've done is they have near monopolized the sales channels. If a consumer wants a new phone, he goes to an operator store, and in the operator store, he's met by a nice clerk who wants to help him out, and uh, what the operators do is give those clerks a little commission uh, based on what kind of phone they se sell. So basically, what all the operators are doing right now is if you go to, and you should do it. Pretend you're a stupid consumer, you know nothing about mobile phones. You just go into a random operator store and say, hi, I would like a new phone, what can you recommend? And within 10 seconds, they quietly steer you to the Android phones. Because they always do that. Take a look at the operator stores near you. Why Android? Um, first of all, not iPhone, because secretly the operators do not like the iPhone very much, because they don't have any influence over the iPhone, right? And uh, Apple just says, okay, here's the iPhone, you may sell it, but you may change nothing. And the operators don't like that. Because what operators are used to, do, to doing uh, is basically, we have the browser and OS layer in the middle, right? And the operators like to meddle with that layers just because they can. There's no technical reason whatsoever. They create apps for you. They, uh, those are usually sh pretty shitty apps that crash more often than they do something useful. And they just change stuff to show the world, oh yes, we are an operator and we can change stuff because we want to change stuff. Well, whatever, that's how operators think. In any case, they can't do that with the iPhone. So, secretly, they don't like the iPhone too much. However, the iPhone, of course, has a great mind share in the, uh, in the consumer market, right? So, if somebody comes in the op into the operator store and says, yeah, I'd like an iPhone, you have no choice but to sell him an iPhone. But if he's not sure, they quietly steer you towards Android. Now, the question is, and again, this is a question I have no answer to, why did they steer you to Android and not towards Windows Phone? Right, because Windows Phone is supposed to be the third operating system, right? Um, basically, I don't know. There is something going on uh, by with, uh, which the operator, uh, operators basically say, okay, you, uh, we are not going to emphasize Windows phones. Of course, we have them in our store, but the average consumer will be steered towards Android. Why is that? Um, I've heard two theories about that. I'm not sure if I fully believe either, but I'm going to give, you, give them to you anyway. The first theory is uh, that it's uh, because of Skype. Microsoft acquired Skype, I don't know, a year ago or something, a year and a half, whatever. And Skype is about free phone calls. And if operators absolutely hate one thing, it's free phone calls, right? Because you have to pay them for the privilege of making a phone call. So basically, the operators are afraid that Microsoft will um, integrate Skype into Windows Phone, and that's why they refuse to sell it. That's theory one. Theory two is it's about, um, it's about uh, support calls. Because if you buy the phone from the operator, something goes wrong, you call to the help desk of the operator. I right? say, so, oh, my phone goes wrong, and I press the button, and nothing happens. Every single support call costs the operator a little bit of money. Right? So they prefer the operating system that generates less support calls. And this theory says that that operating system is Android and not Windows Phone. Again, I'm not sure if that's true, but these two explanations, Skype and support calls, are the only two I've heard. In any case, there's something fishy going on here. And um, basically, 
what the, uh, what the operators refuse to do is sell Windows phones. So that's one more thing to keep in mind. Keep a close eye on Windows Phone sales figures. In theory, they could just jump up because something has become unstuck in the sales channel that's ruled by the operators. So they meddle in the middle just because they can. There's one company that profits from that, and that's Opera. For uh, technical reasons, I will explain in a minute. Opera. Um, if you follow Opera's press releases, nearly all of them are, OK, Opera is now teaming up with Operator X from Country Y to bring Opera Mini to uh, Feature Phone Z. And this is what uh, Opera's core business actually is right now. They are basically making money by selling their browsers to whoever is interested in the mobile market. And that whoever fairly often turns out to be operators. First of all, because uh, operators like to change stuff just because because they can, and secondly, because Opera Mini especially allows people to go uh, online on their mobile phones uh, fairly cheaply. And of course, operators like that, because e even if you go online fairly cheaply, you make uh, more money for the operator than when you don't go online at all. So that's uh, what Opera is doing. Finally, of course, I already mentioned it, there's one danger up here uh, in the sales layer for the operators. And that's Apple. Because Apple is a single mobile player who's not an operator who actually has established a connection to the consumer, a direct connection to the consumer. And um, that basically means that they are now kind of competing with the operators. Not really, not on the connection layer, of course. There, nothing is happening. But on the sales layer, they are kind of competing with the operators right now. And we will have to see how that plays out. Because the iPhone has such a huge mind share, even with normal consumers, the operators cannot afford to say, OK, we don't sell it anymore, because they would lose a lot of profit. So they can't do that. So this is the complete picture of the mobile market. Who is confused? Yeah, OK, thank you. You have understood the mobile market. Those who did not raise their hands, I'm sorry, but you've got a lot to learn. You are supposed to be confused by this. So I'll give you my executive summary. It's complicated. OK, I've got a few minutes left of my presentation. And I'm now finally, finally, finally going to talk about mobile browsers, which is why we're all here. And I'm first going to give you a list. I think some of you will have seen this list before. Which mobile browsers are there, actually? These are the browsers I've identified and tested for at least five minutes. There are more mobile browsers, such as OpenWave, who's not on the list, but I've never even seen that browser, so it's off this list. Should you test your mobile website in all these browsers? In theory, yes, you should. In practice, don't be silly. You can't. Um, in order to help you figure out what to do, I'm going to make, uh, draw a few distinctions in this huge list. First of all, the WebKit-based browsers. There's a lot of WebKit-based browsers uh, around now. Um, you, will, you see them highlighted here. Um, basically, what we're seeing now, WebKit has most market share in the mobile world, followed by Presto, the Opera rendering engine, and Firefox and IE have a very tiny market percentage first. What you're seeing here is a few old browsers that use their own rendering engine, their proprietary rendering engine. And in the mobile world, a proprietary rendering engine is a code for crap rendering engine. So avoid these browsers at all costs. In fact, all of these uh, three vendors, BlackBerry, NetFront, and UC, have now switched to WebKit. Here's BlackBerry WebKit. I haven't put NetFront and UC uh, in this list yet, because I haven't really tested them yet. But we are seeing a shift, especially from the proprietary rendering engines, to WebKit. Now, the fundamental point to remember here is that there is no single WebKit. If somebody tells you, yes, my mobile site should work on WebKit, laugh in his face because he has no clue what he's talking about. Uh, the problem is that WebKit is a rendering engine. 
Um, so basically, you take HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you put it into WebKit, and WebKit does its magic and gives you a rendered page, which sounds great until you realize that you have, uh, if you get that rendered page, it's something you actually have to make sure that shows on the screen of your phone, right? Because the user wants to see it. And you have to write those connections yourself. Similarly, you have to make sure that the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript actually ends up in WebKit, and you have to write those connections for yourself. Uh, a good example is uh, hardware-accelerated animations, uh, which are pretty popular and which WebKit in theory supports, but you as a device vendor or as a browser vendor or an operating system vendor must make sure that you actually make a connection from WebKit to the GPU or however you create those hardware-accelerated animations. And you have to do that yourself. Um, you have to make sure that WebKit receives all mouse events, all keyboard events, all touch events, and that kind of stuff. And finally, not everybody uses the same version of WebKit. Especially when a company starts out with WebKit, they take the latest uh, WebKit version, they uh, start to work on all this stuff that takes much longer than they expected, and by the time they're more or less done, there's a new WebKit version going out, which may be incompatible in subtle ways with the old WebKit version, which is why they can't simply swap the rendering engine. So, creating your own WebKit-based browser is not simple or anything which is basically why I think there will be uh, actually less WebKit browsers instead of more in the future. Because people will figure out, OK, this is too complicated. We're going to ask uh, somebody else to create our browser for it. Um, but we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. In any case, there is no WebKit on mobile. Be specific in what you ask for. In fact, I mean, in practice, of course, WebKit is a code for iOS and Android. But uh, when you talk to clients, be very uh, careful to explicitly specify, OK, our site will work and uh, your site will work on the iPhone and on Android, on Safari and the Android browser. Don't say WebKit in general, because in theory, they could say, hey, this Netfront browser on the Nintendo uh, thingy also uses WebKit, and my website doesn't work in it. And you said you would uh, make sure that my website worked in WebKit. So in order to avoid that, be specific in the browsers that you're going to support. Final concept, proxy browsers. I already mentioned Opera Mini. I already mentioned that it's for operators and for people in the developing world, it's a very interesting option. Why is that the case? A normal browser, you request a web page, and an HTTP request goes out to the server, you get an HTML page, the browser parses it and sees, oh, I need that CSS page, HTTP request, JavaScript, HTTP, image, 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 video, whatever. And it sends out HTTP requests for all those assets. Then it starts to render on the device itself and eventually shows a web page. That is how browsers have worked from the, start, uh, from the beginning of time, right? That's how all web, uh, desktop browsers work, and that's how many, but not all, mobile browsers work. A proxy browser, of which Opera Mini is by far the most important, a proxy browser does something completely different. If you request a web page in a proxy browser, it sends out a request to a special server, a special Opera Mini server, a special UC server, whatever. Every browser vendor has its own servers. It's that server that actually makes the HTTP request to the website and downloads the uh, CSS, JavaScript, and uh, images and sort of stuff to that server. Then it starts to render the page on the server, and it basically sends back a compressed bitmap to the client with hotspots where, uh, where the user can click. Now, the big advantage of doing this is that it's cheap, right? An Opera Mini client uh, only basically has to be able to show that bitmap, plus uh, the hotspots, you have to be able to click on the hotspots, plus a few UI elements. And that's basically it, which means that it can run on pretty crappy hardware, which means that it's very suited to all the phones. Secondly, because you are uh, se sending out a request and get back a compressed bitmap, the data costs are very, very low, much, much lower than we, when you request, I don't know, 100K of HTML, 70K of CSS, 220K of JavaScript, and uh, lots and lots and lots of images. So basically, 
Opera Mini and the other proxy browsers are an excellent choice when you want to keep down your cost of browsing, which is why they're so very popular in the developing world. And which is why the operators say, OK, we want Opera Mini on this and that uh, cheap feature phone, so that people will start to browse at all, instead of not browsing. There's also a disadvantage to proxy browsers. There's no client-side interaction, because uh, the proxy client can't handle that. It does support JavaScript. If in Opera Mini you see a, you go to a web page with you know a nice AJAX interface and stuff, and if you click on that link, a request goes out for more data and the page changes. As soon as you click that link in Opera Mini, a request goes back to the Opera Mini server and tells it, okay, what do I do next? And it's the Opera Mini server that runs the JavaScript, fetches the resources, rebuilds the page, and sends a new version of that page to the client. Um, so basically, what we're seeing here is that by giving up client-side interaction, you allow yourself to browse much cheaper. So, which proxy browsers are there? Opera Mini, fairly important. You see, which is basically the Chinese Opera Mini. Bolt is not important anymore. Amazon Silk on the Kindle. Uh, and the Kindle Fire can run as a proxy browser, which does not make sense to me. Ask me after the, my session. And OV finally is Nokia's proxy browser. Again, Opera Mini is by far the most important. So whatever else you do, take your iPhone, Android, Blackberry, whatever you have, and download Opera Mini now and start testing your websites on it. Because testing it on Opera Mini will teach you a lot more about how the mobile web really works, because it's different. It's different from all other browsers. So do that. Finally, some very quick advice about setting up a device lab. This doesn't really have to do with the rest of my presentation, but I get this question so often that I now append this slide to every single presentation I do. You are a freelancer, you want to start serious uh, mobile testing, how do you do that? Save about 100, oh, it should be euros, 100 euros per month. If you save about 100 euros per month, you can buy about two devices a year. Make sure you buy a non-iPhone, non-Android device, because a lot of people still surf on devices that are neither iPhone nor Android. Buy a Black Blackberry, a Nokia, stuff like that. Be sure to buy at least one non-touchscreen phone, because not all users actually use touchscreen phones, and you have to understand how the interaction works when you don't have a touchscreen, when you have to use, uh, I don't know, a T9 keyboard or a four-way navigation. If you buy a second Android, make very sure that it comes from a different vendor than your first one. So if you already have a Samsung, the next one should be an LG or an HTC, HTC or a Motorola, because there are differences between the various Android devices. Install Opera Mini, I already told you, but really, really do this on your iPhone, on your Android, like now, and start testing your sites on it. And finally, you should swap devices with other people around you. Because you are a freelancer or a small company some, somewhere, and I'm absolutely certain that somewhere in the same town as you, there's another freelancer or small company who has exactly the same problem. Uh, give them a ring, uh, say, OK, we go, uh, shall we swap devices? Do you have a Samsung Android? I've got an HTC Android. And you swap the devices for a while, and you can test. And if you uh, buy new devices, coordinate with them to make sure that you don't buy the same device accidentally. So remember this, it's actually not that difficult. For some reason, people get quite hung up on uh, spending more money on devices, which is strange to me because it's just a business cost, right? You spend money on a laptop, right? You don't even think about it. You say, OK, it's a business cost. I need a laptop for my business. Nowadays, you also need mobile devices for your business, and you just have to uh, earn back those costs from your clients. So, in this presentation, I have given you an overview of the mobile platform market. I've given you more questions than answers. I know, I'm sorry, but I don't know the answers either. Nobody knows. I just hope I've given you enough kind of points to think about and that you understand the mobile market slightly better. Than you, uh, than you did before you came to this session. Thank you so much for your attention. I think we have a few minutes for questions. No, oh, we don't have any time for questions. So thank you, and have a good conference. <laughs>